Well, hello everyone. My name is Rhonda Fisher and I am the clinical program lead for team training at the American Hospital Association. Welcome to today's sponsored webinar, The Future of Obstetrics, the latest practices improving maternal outcomes. We're extremely honored to have Relias sponsor today's webinar. You'll get to hear more about their mission and vision coming up in the webinar shortly. But before we get started, just a few rules of engagement to highlight. You can access audio by listening in through your computer speakers or through your phone. Please note that you're going to be in a listen-only mode. If you're having issues, you should be able to access the toolbar at the bottom to switch to either phone audio or computer audio. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website in a few days. Slides were sent via email this morning, um, but they'll also be shared in the chat if you need to pick them up there. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions for our speakers, please enter them into the Q&A pod, which you can find at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar. And I will be doing a moderated Q&A session at the end of the webinar today. If you have any technical questions or comments in general, feel free to put them into the chat pod and we'll address those as quickly as we can. You can put your questions into the Q&A pod and we'll get to those at the very end of the webinar. So please note that all participants on the webinar can view the chat pod, but it won't be included in the recording. All right, finally, after our webinar is over today, you'll have an evaluation that will pop up in your browser. We really do value your feedback, so please do take a couple of minutes to complete it. So with that, I want to move on and uh, let you know there is our kind of agenda and objectives for today. And it is my great pleasure to uh, get to introduce you to our speakers today. Laura Sparkman holds a Master of Health Administration from Lindenwood University and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing for the University of Missouri. She's been a nurse for over 37 years and leading patient safety and improvement work for over 22 years. For the past six years, she served as a clinical leader at Relias, one of the largest healthcare education and solutions providers in the US that is leading the industry in healthcare workforce readiness. She also leads a healthcare strategy, um, thought leader and clinical expert in patient safety, risk reduction, high reliability, and quality improvement in acute care. Jill Williamson has a background inclusive of, whoops, let's introduce you to Jill. Keep our, oh, it's not moving forward. There we go. Technicality. Jill has a background inclusive of 24 years of nursing experience. Her current position is as the director of education for a large healthcare system, and she focuses on education across the continuum of care. She holds a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree with a focus on management and leadership and also holds certification as a nurse executive. She's active in the American Nurses Association and the Association for Nursing Professional Development. Merta DeVolt is a Senior Program Manager in the Providence Health Nursing Institute Clinical Academy. She currently leads the development, maintenance, and implementation of transition into practice curricula for a multi-state system in the following specialties, obstetrics, neonatal, pediatrics, and nursing professional development. She has a special interest in innovative teaching strategies, debriefing, and making learning engaging and effective for both learners and facilitators. So um, we are extremely honored to have these three presenters today. And with that, I will turn it over to Laura, who will tell you a little bit more about Relias and enter into today's webinar. Thank you, Rhonda, so much. We're thrilled to be here today. And I definitely want to thank Jill and Merta for joining us. I think there's nothing better than to hear firsthand from um, healthcare leaders on the front line, really working hard to transform and improve care. And so that's 
uh, one of the things I think that aligns us all. The Relias mission is to measurably improve the lives of the most vulnerable members of society and those who care for them. So that is a, a, a true passion for Relias and something uh, we take very seriously and are very proud of to be part of that work. Um, today, uh, you already uh, learned about who we are, um, what we're going to focus on around education models and factors that influence the effectiveness of improving uh, competency and measuring that for our workforce. Uh, related to OB patient safety and working on reducing maternal mortality and severe morbidity, and that is with our partners, OSF and Providence. Just a few words, um, not going to spend a lot of time on this. You will have access to this in the PowerPoint presentation, but just a little bit about who Relias is. Um, we um, do have an amazing set of solutions that focus on improving outcomes related to moms and uh, uh, birthing persons and their babies. And we also cover the continuum of care and our solutions around recruiting and staffing, learning and performance. And Relias OB, as an example, sits in that performance category, as does uh, Relias OB onboarding and uh, enterprise-wide onboarding and nurse and um, allied health professional assessments that's about right placement and readiness to practice. Compliance management, a, a huge uh, new endeavor for us around making sure competency, especially in the nurse workforce field, we know this is um, a super hot topic, uh, but again, this is areas where we excel and provide tools for all healthcare leaders to manage um, their initiatives and their teams. Again, just a little high level of our expertise. Um, we are a global team working on a very diverse uh, population and a very complicated healthcare system. We have significant partnerships across the country. And we have uh, something I'm always amazed about 11,000 um, service customers and 9,000 courses that are maintained and reviewed and accredited in ongoing maintenance and um, uh, over a thousand years of healthcare experience. And basically what that means, we have uh, a lot of senior experienced healthcare people who are doing the work that you have done, uh, but we're, we're in an education environment now and trying to continue to transform and improve healthcare. The um, another component I wanted to share with you is nurse.com is part of Relias. And again, that's a community for nurses. So I would ask that you take a few moments and when you get an opportunity at the end of this call to check out nurse.com and see what it's about. We have 8 million unique visits to our site a year. That is huge and significant and something we're really very proud of. In terms of the topic today, um, maternal mortality has been something we've been focused on for many years. We created education and a perinatal safety solution um, in you know, 2010, 20, uh, 2009. But what's been interesting is to see what's happened over that timeline. Really what started in 2015 in a public way was the Lancet Journal article that came out that told the world that the US had the worst maternal mortality rate than any first world developed country all the way through current year 2023, um, where there's been a ton of focus and work, but it's come out of this progressive review and federal engagement and state level engagement and hospital and acute healthcare system engagement on what are we gonna do to correct this, this issue that we have. Um, birthing Friendly is now part of what came forward in the inpatient prospective payment rule. And so that means a lot of focus on special populations like the black, the brown population and natural um, and uh, Native Americans who um, unfortunately have a higher rate of mortality and morbidity than any other population by race. And if you look at this slide right here, non-Hispanic blacks, this is the latest and updated data in this 
topic, but we know we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we are seeing some great progress. Also, just in general, we're dealing with a national emergency around the healthcare workforce. 55% frontline workers report COVID burnout. We're coming out of COVID clearly, but we are now, and we're seeing this time and time again, healthcare systems are still dealing with the fallout from that and, and recovering. It's a slow but steady process and we're making progress. 66% of acute and critical care nurses considering leaving the profession entirely. This is something we have to focus on together and work on together. And I think you're gonna hear some lessons learned today that start to address this. And then something else we wanna manage is the 75% of just reporting being overwhelmed. Lastly, and I think this is really important, even at the federal level, social determinants, DEI are on the tip of everybody's tongue right now in acute care. We've got to get better at managing all populations universally and equally. And something to think about, 75% of factors that contribute to health status is the social determinants. 25% is your biological, behavioral, and medical factors. So think about that. It's really flipping uh, the model on its head. We spent a lot of time in protocols, disease states, disease management, but knowing that we can make such an impact if we address the social side of things, community-based care, wellness, and getting access to healthcare will make a significant and huge difference. And the other thing I want to just raise is that technology and advancing technology, moving away from traditional learning to tech-based learning modalities. And if you look at this, I, I just find this was really interesting and from an article in Business Wire, but even going back to the 1960s, all the way to 2020, and you look at virtual reality, where it was in 2015 and the trajectory, that's an example of how technology is advancing and that is gonna be a player in the years to come uh, about how we deliver effective learning immersive learning, assessment-based learning, simulations, VR experiences. Those are the type of education modalities that have the highest success rate in actually transferring knowledge and helping retain knowledge. When you do that, you build confidence, you build competency, and that helps the nurse workforce want to stay engaged and not leave your organization. So with that, I'm going to um, hand it over um to osf jill thank you laura i'm going to talk a little bit um, to start with um, around who osf healthcare is just to get a perspective of some of the uh, areas of focus i'm going to speak to so we're a catholic healthcare organization um, we span the state of illinois we have one hospital a critical access hospital up in the up there um, and i've got um, just an overview of how many employees we have, as well as what is underneath of the OSF umbrella. This is a pictorial of where our hospitals are across Illinois. Um, we are set up in three regions. So we've got the central region, we've got the eastern region, and we also have the western region. And from a uh, live birth perspective, this is the overview of the volume of births we have across our healthcare system. So we have, I have these listed just again, to give you a little perspective, um, an FY21 and an FY22. Um, we have one large uh, hospital in our central region that has a majority of our births. And then we've got two other large facilities, but you can see kind of where we span or sit there with, the, with regard to our volume of births. So as I talk about the use um, of the tool, itself. Our partnership that we have with Relias really started at the entity level back in 2016. So in 2016, we started working with um, using Relias, um, the OB assessment as our um, tool. And then we went from, um, shifted from entities, the whole hospital or the whole healthcare system, excuse me, really shifted to using that the tool um, in 2016 across all of our OB hospitals. We expanded um, and included additional hospitals. We began to bring on additional hospitals. We spanned outside of our um, that central region. And um, in 2020, we had a full healthcare expansion using the OB tool. 
in this last year, we went down the path of full integration. We uh, transitioned to a new LMS, and we have now incorporated all of our educational tools under the umbrella of a corporate OSF corporate university. And so you can just kind of see as we've progressed along in our partnership and utilizing um, the tools, this is where we sit. Overarching, when we look at education at OSF, uh, much like many of you, I'm sure, we've really started to, um, it's kind of the pre-COVID and the post-COVID era. And so really beginning to shift a lot of our thinking around our modalities for learning and how do we begin to bring training and education um, alongside of those changes where we have blended learning models, um, we're utilizing simulation, so when we think about our OB, we've got um, education, we are working, are focusing on a lot of insight to simulation. Um, and then we are also then, um, as I'll speak to towards the end of my section, talking a little bit around where we're headed um, from a virtual reality perspective. So we've got kind of some upcoming research studies focused on that. Um, as we look at our training and education model, we have certainly had to do a lot of um, shifting um, due to uh, staffing crisis across the nation, our financial state that then follows that. Uh, we're really focused, I think, as most healthcare systems are around the reduction of non-productive hours. And so we think about, you know, the years of, that we've spent using time of in-the-seat training and education and how do we begin to shift that um, and do less of the in-seat and more of that hands-on um, active learning um, and then decreasing our non-productive hours. We've had to do a lot of focus on our um, the shift in our uh, really looking at our strategic initiatives um, and making sure that it is um, there's really value added when we're doing training and education versus doing it just to have kind of that blanket one size fits all. So shifting away from that and, and beginning to focus more on that targeted education. And another area for us is that shift in autonomy, um, that it's more of a, um, a pull and less of a push. Again, really following that, that elimination of the one size fits all. So when I look at the Relias OB, um, this is our quarterly cadence that we focus on. So we have across our healthcare system have set up where providers and nurses are, are following this model. In our first quarter, um, the fetal assessment and monitoring course. In the second quarter, we have our hypertension and pregnancy. In our third quarter, we do the managing shoulder dystocia. And then you can see in our fourth quarter, we focus on uh, the obstetrical and postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and so this is really where when we have new individuals who come into our system, they just come right into that quarterly fold um, since these don't build on one another and they can take the topics um, with regard to just following that um, cadence of quarters. Our goals for the training and education in the OB Relias are that all employees will score above the 50th percentile for both that knowledge and judgment. So anyone with results that fall outside of that right upper quadrant are required to complete um, a, a very defined learning plan, and then they retake that assessment. So I'm going to show you some of our outcomes that we had when we followed this model and we did our fetal assessment. So this is in the fetal assessment and monitoring module, and we had, this is the nurses. I populated those exclusively. So nurses in that first round, um, and you can see where they sit with regard to the, um, the quadrant. So green is where we wanna see them, red is where we don't wanna see them, obviously. And so those individuals who sat in that bottom section went through our remediation plan. So that would be, they were below the 50th percentile for both knowledge and judgment. So they completed learning pathways um, and then retook the assessment. So part of the learning journey is the clinical pearls. And they take that, receive credit hours for those. You can see those listed here. Um, and as they navigate through that, they not only um, walk through the knowledge, but then they also receive credit. When they completed their reassessment, so you can see our outcomes, this is system-wide um, on the reassessment. So this is only the individuals who fell out below the 50th percentile, and this is where they sat when they retook um, this assessment. This is a pictorial, so you can kind of see those side by side. Um, that red box then is the reassessment. And then I pull, pulled this together. I think it's meaningful when you look at, um, you know, that the numbers, the volume of those who were in each one of those and then where, where they sit in, from an improvement perspective. Um, it really demonstrates the use of that tool 
Um, and we don't use it in a punitive manner when you think about those nurses who are taking it, those providers that are taking it. Some of it is a learning curve on really learning how to um, navigate through the learning modules, but it also becomes a way for them to see um, their progression and their success as they learn through those learning journeys. So as we worked through this, um, when anytime you think about something from a system perspective and you think about um, bringing providers and nurses into the same space, there are um, always some uh, ways I think that we, some lessons learned, some ways you can navigate that better. And so I would say that what OSF learned was that the successes were focused on the fact that there was a team-based approach. Um, and so when you bring um, those groups, those learner groups together, um, they're not always something that we always do, and so it becomes a little bit of a learning curve, and so the team-based approach was favored. Um, we also found that a champion was needed. So obviously, when you think about um, having a nurse champion and then also having a provider champion who's really able to speak to the use of the tool and the expectations, um, also setting and communicating expectations clearly, um, that comes alongside almost anything we do, um, but calling that out, the importance of that. And then we did start small and continue to spread. And we definitely felt like that was an area um, that helped support success for us. And when we look at value, you know, I, we talked about the results to the assessment, but um, the, the internal value is the impact to those educational outcomes, which that have a downstream impact to our patient care. Um, and then again, really having a positive impact to that team-based model. Um, and then the external is that we are aligned then to the regulatory requirements. And so those are just some of the areas of focus when we think about the value added. This has definitely been um, provided us directional guidance and iterative work. So when, when we have our learners take the assessment, that data then helps drive identified gaps. And so there are times we have learned in certain regions that we have an identified gap and we're able then to target more specific education. Um, and that has helped drive us into even where do we go for insight to simulations? How do we prioritize um, where we need to focus our work um, first? And so the data from Relias can be used not only from a individual learner, but also from a um, maybe from a region or a hospital perspective and help drive uh, your areas of focus. As we know, there's so many competing priorities and how you may stack things to make sense. Um, our next layer of education, our simulations, as I mentioned, we did start in the area of greatest need. That was easy for us to start to see in a specific area that we had um, a newer learner group and we wanted to then have uh, more direct education focus. And so in, in October, we did a um, interactive online module. We focused on the ED and then we did um, focus maternal hemorrhage and maternal hypertension as well. Our patient outcomes, uh, while we didn't always have um, all the areas um, of success, the risk documented prior to admission, the whole system did not meet target, but we started to see individual hospitals starting to meet target. Um, and then the documentation of cumulative blood loss, OSF did meet target on that. And so you can start to see a downstream positive impact to our patient outcomes specifically. And in the maternal hypertension, we have driver metrics, we have specific hospitals that started to see um, a success where one OSF, our entire organization wasn't meeting target. We are starting to see an uptick of our hospitals um, with those positive patient outcomes. So our next layer of education, um, we did update our care guidelines um, and we had just deployed our annual education. So not only are we doing targeted, we are doing again, the annual education. And then as I mentioned, we are uh, have opened up a, a specific study. We have a control study where we're looking at um, the utilization of virtual reality. And so knowing that there is a lot of time intensive um, training education, we're trying to find out whether or not utilizing virtual reality where those modules tend to be much um, smaller time that will that will we still see positive impact? So we're going to compare the learners who've taken the virtual reality and those who have not um, and try to see whether or not we, that modality makes sense with this specific topic. And I think from here, I'm going to turn it over to Merta. Thank you so much. Let me grab control of our slide presentation here. So um, as we move into talking about Providence's experience using Relias, I'm going to focus on um, specifically the onboarding and how we transition our new obstetric nurses into their specialty, whether they're brand new nurses or they're experienced but new to the obstetric specialty. 
Um, we know from the literature that there are six key areas that you can see on the right that have been identified as a big gap between nursing school and clinical practice. And we also know from the literature and from our own experience in our organization of our residency and fellowship programs that we've implemented, that there's key pieces that can drive success in that transition over the first year for a new nurse. And those are listed here on the left. Um, one of the big things is that in addition to uh, all of the standardized evidence-based programs, the didactic, the length of the program, we know that competence and confidence do develop over time. And so the best way to support this is with that standardized curriculum. That's going to yield the best outcomes for our uh, nurses in their confidence and competence. And so a little overview of the journey that our nurses go through when they are hired into the obstetric curriculum uh, or specialty rather, they are hired, they go through new employee orientation, then they enter our residency and fellowship program. Um, after they have completed that, around six months to one year of practice, they will enter into ongoing education using Relias OB along with the rest of our staff and our providers. And so I'm going to talk mostly about the residency and fellowship, and I'll touch on what they do when they transition into the ongoing education as well. So a little bit about our organization. Move my slide here. So we have 44 obstetrical units across our system of 52 hospitals. Over half of these units are accredited with the ANCC through P, uh, the Practice Transition Accreditation Program. We have about 3,100 nurses registered as users in our Relias platform. And since 2016, we've onboarded 940 residents and 955 fellows. Just in the last six months or so, we've enrolled about um, 300 residents and fellows. So we have a really large program our organization is geographically spread out. We stretch from West Texas to Alaska. You can see here on the slide where we're located. And when our residents and fellows enter the obstetric specialty, they go through our program. You can see the components here in this outline. It shows the critical elements. We have a 12, 12 month time span, a staged preceptor model. Um, we use peer support, it's competency-based, and we have didactic education that's delivered over time. As a part of that didactic education, we have a series of building blocks that begin with our Relias onboarding modules. So these are set up similarly as the Relias for OB modules that Jill was just describing. There is an assessment that they take first that allows us to identify um, certain areas where they need shoring up uh, and then provides them with a personalized learning path for them to complete. In addition to using the modules, we have a blended model. So we build on the foundational knowledge that the, that the Relias onboarding modules provide the learners and then spend time in the classroom doing some interactive application-based activities such as case studies and things of that nature. Um, followed up by clinical application. So the ideal progression is you learn a topic in the module, you practice it in the classroom, and then it's reinforced and practice again on the floor with preceptors. Just to highlight one of the great things that the Relias modules do for us um, is, well, I guess before I go into that, I just wanna mention these are the, the modules that are included in the onboarding package. So it covers clinical knowledge and judgment, core clinical skills, prioritization. And then our organization has been deliberate in including the implicit bias and maternal fetal outcomes module, as well as the social determinants of health module from Relias. But here's an example of what that initial assessment results may look like. So this is a actual learner's results we don't expect that they're going to be scoring high as they are new graduate nurses or they're new to the OB specialty, but this does allow us to prepare for um, talking with the preceptor about some extra time spent on postpartum patients, for example, with this person, um, or spending a little bit more time on that topic in class when we're able to identify common areas that need a little bit of extra attention. 
So as an educator, that allows us to give a little bit more personalized um, approach to education rather than a one size fits all. A couple other components I want to highlight about the classroom piece of our education is um, that we do use the virtual and in-person settings. So as many of you probably experienced during COVID, we had to flip to the virtual setting. We have a lot of our hospitals in our organization that have stayed in the virtual setting because they uh, prefer it just overcome some geographical barriers. We have a lot of hospitals in the LA region where it's hard to commute. And so that provides us some um, increased flexibility as well. We use Moodle, which has a um, online virtual classroom. So we do synchronous classroom sessions, as well as um, integrating into both, whether they're in the in-person setting or they're in the virtual setting, we integrate that active learning. Here's some examples of how we do that. Um, we also know that our new graduate nurses are expected to be competent in soft skill areas. You can see some examples of those here. Um, lack of competence and confidence in these areas has been associated in the literature with a high turnover intention and high rates among new graduate nurses. So therefore, we focus heavily on those soft skills in the classroom activities uh, that we engage our nurses in. And then our uh, program is competency-based. So we focus uh, on the professional role of nursing. We also have separate job function focus. This means that it's not necessarily time-based or checklist-based, which allows us to set up our new nurses for a really successful transition. The third part of that building block is the clinical application. So whatever they've learned in the modules and then um, had reinforced in the classroom, they de then bring that to the floor or to simulation. And so we have both virtual and in-person simulation available. We've identified a set of core skills that require practice in the in-person setting with expert guidance. And primarily those skills are ones that may result in injury to the patient if the new hire doesn't practice them first, such as blood administration or fundamental skills, which are essential to performance like cervical exams. Other skills might fall into the frequent fixed um, or facility categories. Those are best left to review during their precepted shifts. So looking at this um, from taking those three building blocks and looking at it with the topic of postpartum hemorrhage, you can see that we use the Relias modules to help educate nurses uh, in the assessment of the acute postpartum patient, measurement of quantitative blood loss, management of uterine apnea, maternal early warning signs, and then we reinforce those in the classroom with the activities you see here in the middle following with an OB hemorrhage simulation and precepted time on the unit. A little bit of data. So this is a virtual class feedback from our learners. What I pay attention to when I'm looking at this data is the, um, the strongly agree and agree that the nurses are feeling confident applying key concepts from the modules in their classroom sessions. Um, and that they can take those to their work environment. Um, also that they're getting peer support and interacting with other residents and fellows um, to enhance their learning. And so you can uh, take a look at that a little bit closer in the handout that we've provided. In our organization, we use the standard validated tool uh, to measure the transition experience of the new graduate nurses. That's the Casey Fink Graduate Nurse Experience Survey. You can see here, this is one part of the survey um, focusing on difficulties. And what I wanna highlight here is that from survey one, which has happened at four weeks of practice to survey three, which they take at one year of practice, their lack of confidence, which is specifically in communication skills, delegation, knowledge deficit, and critical thinking has decreased over time, as well as their fears for patient safety have also decreased over time. And so that tells us that we're hitting the mark with what we're trying to do in providing our new nurses um, an excellent experience. Next, another metric that we measure is our first year turnover. What I'm showing you here is our pre-COVID numbers. Um, the blue line is all nurses in our organization. 
the green line is nurses that have gone through the clinical academy. So this particular graph is not specific to obstetrics, but you can see that we've maintained a turnover rate significantly lower than nurses that do not attend the clinical academy. So what happened with COVID? Oops, let me go back. So this is 2021 to the present. You can see that it's gone up for both. But even though there has been a significant increase since COVID, we're still maintaining a turnover rate significantly lower in comparison to nurses outside the academy. So let's zoom in a little bit on um, just one region in our organization. This is Southern California. This encompasses five hospitals in LA and six hospitals in Orange County. They're all PTAP accredited, which means they're all meeting the standards for our clinical academy program. And this graph is showing obstetric RN specifically outside the clinical academy is in red. And the green line is showing OB nurses that went through the clinical academy. So this is a really great testament to how impactful a program like ours can be on first year turnover, particularly in a region like LA where there's really stiff competition for nurses. One more metric on our residency and fellowship program. Um, so this is cost avoidance, uh, organizational savings that we've been able to achieve. We use a standard calculation that HR, finance, and nursing uses throughout the entire organization. Um, I've shared that with you here. I think if you want to um, look for numbers similar in your organization, you need a reliable data source for all nurses turnover percentage, your residents turnover percentage, average salary, and then total residents in the program. So here's another interesting thing. It's very difficult to tie um, residency programs to patient outcomes because there's so many potential competing factors that could be impacting patient outcomes. However, there have been several great studies that have shown that certain situations, such as you see here on the left, poor staffing, lack of competence and confidence, um, poor peer support, unfamiliar work environments, um, this can lead to patient outcome such as missed care, medication errors, fail failure to document, um, failure to communicate or report changes in patient's condition or adverse patient events. So I think um, it's fair to say that if we are impacting the things on the left-hand side with a robust residency program that has um, very excellent foundational education, then we can hopefully impact those things on the right. I'm going to share just a little bit more about um, our residency program. This is zooming in a little further in Southern California to our LA hospitals. I want to just draw your attention to this graph because this is showing uh, resident saturation on our units. The graph or the um, bars on the left hand side is day shift, the bars on the right hand side are night shift. And up at the top, we've got Providence Tarzana, Little Company of Mary Torrance, and Providence St. Joseph. Um, these have really high resident saturation, sometimes as high as 50% on night shift. And so I know that that's a concern for a lot of people having a lot of new nurses on their unit, thinking about patient outcomes and safety, um, particularly as you're focusing on how to keep them prepared and competent on the floor. So let's take a look at how this plays out in our organization. So as I said earlier, once they've finished the residency and fellowship program, they move into ongoing education on the same cadence as our nurses, physicians, and midwives. We do hypertension, and I'm just going to focus on hypertension and hemorrhage for this uh, talk. We do that on an alternating year basis um, to meet the Joint Commission standards for maternal safety. And once they enter into that, I'll show you just a couple recent um, completion percentages here. So those are those same hospitals I was showing you that have a really high resident saturation, saturation of new graduate nurses. Um, and this is hypertension. So this is looking at January 2020 through the end of 2022, which is when we did our second round of education for hypertension. And you can see they have a really high percentage completion rate. This next one is 
um, hemorrhage. And we're currently in the second round of education for hemorrhage using the nursing care of the patient with obstetric and postpartum hemorrhage module through Relias. Um, and so that's why the completion rates aren't quite as high yet. They will get there, but I wanted to share that with you. And so let's think about what kind of impact this might have on a large portion of the staff, if the large portion of the staff at these hospitals are completing these, not only our residency and fellowship program, but then going on to use the Relias OB modules um, in a similar fashion to the way Jill has been implementing at her organization. And so let's take a look at some of the data that I pulled. Um, this is maternal morbidity among patients with severe hypertension, those same hospitals I was mentioning. This data is from January of 2020 to June of this year. Um, this is the percentage of deliveries we can see that even though Little Company of Mary Torrance has a higher rate, the other two hospitals remain on par with Holy Cross or lower in their percentage. So what happens here is we've got the system wide. We have um, the Southern California region is the second column, the three hospitals. And then this is their rate after education. And so the green columns are 2019 to 2020. The gray is the rates from 2020 to 2023. Let's take a look at it with hemorrhage. So again, green columns are 2019 to 2020. And then the gray are 2020 to 2023. So with the high saturation of new graduates on these units, they're maintaining that same percentage, if not decreasing it after they have received um, our education. And then the last graph I wanna show you is another metric that we look at, which is the hemorrhage risk screening. And this is uh, looking at reassessment. So our organizations were really great at doing the initial assessment and we implemented um, a campaign for them to increase the rates of reassessment. And so the green here is 2019 to 2020. And then you can see the increase in percentage of completing those reassessment hemorrhage risk screenings after the education 2020 to 2023. And so the takeaways for me on this is first education matters. So with the combination of both the onboarding education and support through transition into practice program, and then rolling into that ongoing Relias OB modules, the simulations, the skills practice, there can be a unit with a skills mix upward of 50% new nurses on a particular shift that's still providing excellent safe care for patients. So simply stated, units that have completed the most education are demonstrating the best outcomes. Second, Support for our new nurses is really critical. If we wanna hang on to the nurses that we are hiring um, for cost savings and more importantly, for better patient outcomes, it's really imperative that we follow the literature on best practice for our transition into practice programs. And so with that, I will say thank you and thank you to um, the AHA and Relias for including me in this presentation. And I think we probably have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you. I want to just say thank you both, uh, Jill and Merta, for sharing um, your stories, your journey, your model, and your outcomes, because I think that it really does tell a great story about um, uh, what it takes to really uh, get to improvement. And I think uh, we're hearing, you know, there's a lot of fatigue out there in in terms of, um, I know you have a lot of your references and such here, uh, which is great. Um, but again, if anybody has any specific questions for Jill or Myrta or for Relias, um, we're happy uh, to address that for you. So um, Rhonda, I'll turn it back over to you. Lovely. Thank you for that incredibly informative presentation as a, um, I've been a nurse myself for over three decades and been involved in a lot of education. So, uh, wow, I'm just really impressed with the work that's being done out there. Um, there were a few uh, questions that came into the chat. 
So uh, some people wanted to know, does this education go out to all OB staff or is it only to those who are new to OB? Um, well, I, oh, I just wanted to make a clarification really quick. So if you're talking, was that for Providence or just a general question? It was just a general question. So I think it could be answered by either one. Yeah, I, I would go ahead, Marta. Yeah, so um, we use, Relias offers two different sets of modules and we use both. So we use the Relias onboarding modules for our new graduate nurses and nurses new to the OB specialty. And then they transition into the Relias OB modules that Jill was really highlighting in her part of the presentation. And they're different because they're different audiences. But yeah, I would look at it this way for the, there is obviously the onboarding content is for new nurses or incumbent nurses transitioning from another area, a specialty into OB. So they need to be oriented to the uh, OB labor and delivery postpartum space. Um, the Relias onboarding, uh, the Relias OB course is really uh, ongoing professional development. So many of our clients use these tools together, but they um, do a traditional orientation or in the case of what Merita was describing, uh, a fellowship and resident, you know, residency and fellowship. And so you can uh, pepper in some of those courses over time, or you can have a very concentrated blended learning orientation. But at about six months and beyond is when you wanna start introducing some of the other modules from Rely SOB because that includes electronic fetal monitoring, hyper, uh, shoulder dystocia, maternal sepsis, um, the, the hemorrhage and hypertension courses as an example. Thank you. Um, also just wondering how that would apply to, you know, with the current workforce shortages, we're seeing a lot of people talking about upskilling. And so, you know, moving med surge nurses over into the postpartum units, for example, or trying to get your postpartum nurses to upskill, to labor. So can you speak to that at all? How, how you would, would you go about upskilling nurses in the same fashion or what, what route would you put them through? I'd love to answer that, Laura, if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, so in our organization, those med surge nurses coming to postpartum or even postpartum nurses that are transitioning into a labor and delivery job are, um, are considered fellows for us. So they go through the full program. They take the Relias onboarding modules, um, the classroom, the simulation, because it is a brand new specialty. And so we definitely use that for upskilling our nurses. Um, that's what's so great about the assessment driven piece and the um, personalized learning that is provided based on that assessment. Because if I have somebody who's a med surge nurse coming into labor and delivery, along with a postpartum nurse coming into labor and delivery, their pathways are gonna look different. And that's where it provides that personalized approach to education, not that one size fits all. Jill, did you wanna make comment on that at all or? Ours is very similar, I would say, when we upskilled even during times of staffing issues and we were really, and we've been focused even at our, within our system to have our nurses then start to provide care. And so they come right on into the quarterly cadence of those and use that, that data to help drive the, the clinical pearls they need to take and, and, and maybe additional education to even support their own um, self-identified areas of opportunity. That's great. I don't know if you saw in the chat, there was a comment that said really amazing data that you're able to pull and just great justification for your programs. Um, there was a question about, it says the data collection and analytics seem really great. Is there a way to evaluate the long-term benefits of the Relias module? Yeah, I, I'm gonna jump in here too. And then of course, uh, Jill and Merita can look at that, but a few, um, both OSF and Providence and several other clients have been long-term clients of ours and are seeing year-over-year -year improvement. Um, but the way that this model works is we're, we deliver through the platform the variation of how, in this case, let's talk about nurses, how nurses score on a standardized validated assessment. 
So if you're doing that assessment every other year, you're seeing the change in what that variation looks like and how those nurses are able to apply the national evidence-based guidelines and everyday clinical scenarios that come out of you know, everyday practice. So it, think about the nurse workforce challenges and the turnover issues. When you have nurses leaving within a year, two years, three years, the dynamic of your nurse workforce is constantly changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for nurse leadership to understand what does the picture of variation look like with my team today? And that is, uh, you know, when we're talking about making sure our team um, is competent and confident as, you know, Merita and Jill are talking about, this is one of the ways you do that is through this assessment-based personalized learning because of the assessment scores, you're able to really have insight into the variation of your team. And again, both of them said this, not in a punitive way, but how can we get better? How can we help these nurses, um, new nurses, incumbent nurses, and your ongoing uh, individual team members who've been there for years, how can we make sure we maintain that high level of performance? And that's through this ongoing longer term view. That's great. Uh, there was a question about what's the cost for each student or program. They commented they really like that it's not one size fits all, but you know, from a managerial perspective or leadership, if you're trying to, you know, make plans budget wise, what would that look like? Yeah, and we are we're happy to follow up with those folks directly, but just in general, we have a very different model about this because our goal is to get as many clinicians using this education, because we've been able to prove over time and time again, not only in the data you saw today in OSF and Providence, but higher scores in education equate to safer practice and less harm and less um, uh, risk. So it really is a, a full you know, patient safety approach in perinatal safety. So we price this uh, as a per birth, because we know how many physicians and nurses it takes to take care of a population. And so uh, we're not counting seats. So I think that that's an administrative advantage. Um, and basically that also applies to any ancillary individuals that you want to have access to some of these solutions like anesthesiology, um, the ED staff that are taking these emergencies, OB emergencies, there are, you know, the Joint Commission requires that anybody that is caring for pregnant persons has to have education and hemorrhage and hypertension as an example. So that includes your ED staff. So we're not, um, you know, counting seats, uh, which can really be uh, an administrative burden when you're trying to run a program like this. And so from what I understand, Laura, uh, from the very beginning when you're speaking about Relias and what they do, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you have, um, I mean, thousands of modules um, that you offer. So, for example, would you, as a career ED nurse, I'm asking you, do you have a module that's specific to, hey, ED nurse, this is, you know, this is specific for you, how you need, what you need to be watching out for or looking for. Do you get that fine tuned in your modules? Absolutely. And we do, um, we're actually in the roadmap because that became a new requirement out of the Joint Commission Regulatory for reducing maternal mortality and hemorrhage and hypertension was to, um, and, and this is what the Joint Commission reviewers are looking at, is what education are you providing to people who are not traditional OB providers or nurses? And so on our roadmap, we are developing content specific to those specialties. They don't need to take, as an example, a full electronic fetal monitoring course or the full hemorrhage or hypertension course, but they need to know and understand the uh, hemorrhage emergencies for pregnant women when they come in and manage that process and, again, get to standardization. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of where a woman is two or three days postpartum, came in with a massive headache. They were given Tylenol, sent home, and died three days later related mm -hmm. to uh, eclampsia. 
And that's because of lack of knowledge of understanding and assessing individuals about if you're postpartum, uh, even, you know, way past 42 days, that is a, a clinical factor that you have to consider in your assessment when they come to your ED with a headache, as an example. And we teach that. And if you're not raising those salient points consistently with your team, that is where we get these errors coming from. Well, and I would say particularly in our more of our critical access hospitals, for example, where, again, you could have nurses coming to pitch hit from any number of departments. So yes. really important what you're speaking to. Um, someone asked the question, have your organizations done anything to address the pay discrepancy between direct hire and contract nurses? From uh, I would imagine that those that's a question to either Jill or Merta. Um, I can't speak to that from my perspective. I apologize. Yeah, that's a little I think outside the scope of the. Yeah, content I was today. thinking. Sorry, I I read that wrong. I was thinking it was um in terms of like maybe new nurses and um, you know, nurses that had been there a while. But um, we'll let that one lie. Apologies for reading that wrong. Um, let's see here. There's another question that says, is this available outside of OB? We're seeing the lack of basic clinical skills and knowledge post-COVID in nurses coming from nursing schools. I feel we need to reteach the basics. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, we did something unique this year, which is we have an enterprise-wide uh, nurse onboarding program that covers med surge, ICU, emergency department nurses, OB, and preceptors. For OB, we wanted to kind of create a linear path for nurses because the learning modality, assessment-based learning, is the same. So just what Merta described, and you can see in their outcomes, it made a significant difference in their patient safety outcomes and the satisfaction of the nurse and reduced turnover and cost if you onboard and then you do professional development in that same education modality. So in addition, we do have a full enterprise wide, but I think what Myrta and um, Jill are both have said is when you have that structured program like a clinical academy at Providence, that makes a difference in nurse confidence and competence. And when you hit those two levers, your nurses, um, don't leave uh, as often as they do without that. So we do have the question, the answer to that question is yes, we do cover the majority of areas of where nurses go straight out of nursing school. And we are hearing this all the time um, around uh, nurses. I mean, some nurses who were trained in COVID never saw a patient until they were hired. Mm -hmm. And the, so that experience is really important, but when you're doing that immersive learning, you're meeting that new nurse where they are, uh, which is really important. So some people uh, might fly through because of their life experience or you know whatever uh, creates them as a whole individual and some need more time. So having a program that just says our program is 12 weeks, whether you sink or fly, that doesn't really hit the need for what we're seeing in new nurses today. Yeah, very well said. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, this has been a fantastic presentation. Thank you for sharing the wealth of your knowledge and resources with us today. Um, for those of you who had questions in the Q&A or in the chat that we didn't get to those, we will do our best to round back with you with the answers to those. But I do want to remind you that you will have an evaluation pop up on your screen uh, in a minute or so as we close out the webinar. And we'd really love for you to fill that out. It's great feedback, not only for us here at the AHA, but for our, our presenters as well. So uh, again, thank you very much. Congratulations on the amazing work that you're doing. I know it's making a difference for both the new nurses coming on board and for the experienced nurses who are working with them. So uh, thank you very much and hope you all have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.